Welcome back. It is 6 p.m. We have a full quorum with all council mem members present. I'm Mayor Bianca Motley Broom. We're going to begin our workshop session. We have two items on the agenda this evening. The first is the on call center answering service presentation by Interactive Utility Communications. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Richardson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. We've been considering an on call answering service for power outages for several years. And I'm finally bringing a presentation for your consideration. The Interactive Utility Communications does have a partnership with Electric Cities of Georgia, and uh, they have service agreements with 10, 13 other cities and plus 10 other utilities. So tonight's presentation will be conducted by Greg Steele. He's the IUC's CEO, so take it away. Well, first of all, uh, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity for me to talk to you about IUC, what we do, who we work with, and and why we think that we're a good answer to any city that's going through uh, service issues after hours. And, and I think that our process and the process that we'll be able to show to you today uh, makes it really clear and simple. Uh, and what's usually a very muddy situation can be actually a very streamlined process. Uh, the screen seems to be going back and forth, but if you wanted to go to page two on this about IUC, just talking about the services and what we do we are a municipal service that's focused on uh, primarily servicing electric, gas, water, sewer, streets, customer service, sanitation, code enforcement, anything that a city needs. We break it down into basically two levels of support. It's an energy service level, and then it's a, it's a city service level. Uh, so whatever those services are and what you'd like for us to try to do on an after hours basis, then we build an application to support that. The cities that we work with uh, in the state of Georgia, of course, Buford, Calhoun, Cairo, Douglas, East Point, Alberton, Fairburn, Fitzgerald, uh, Lawrenceville, Marietta Power and Water, Monroe, Norcross, Statesboro, Sugar Hill, Washington, West Point, and Winder are all kind of a mix. Some of them are gas primary service, some are electric primary service, and some, like Calhoun, is a primary water service. Um, but as you go to the next page, one of the things that you'll see is, you know, how did we design the facility? Well, the facility is completely redundant on all levels. Our firewalls are basically, it's a dual redundancy firewall that load balances, meaning that if call volumes are so great to go through the system, it actually balances the volume of calls going from at t fiber to our Comcast internet. So we never have an overflow of call activity, regardless of the numbers. Uh, we have a UPS system on every workstation. We have multiple UPS battery backups for all of the servers that are here. Plus we have a 36 KW uh, generator that supports the facility. So we actually operate on our own grid, uh, even though we're powered by Marietta, we're within the Marietta city and we are serviced by underground wire uh, by two from Marietta. We also work a lot like Georgia 811, if you're familiar with them. Uh, we bring everybody into the main facility to go through training for six months and 600 calls. After that, we give them the ability to work remotely while at the same time maintaining a presence on, on campus here. Um, when we go ahead and go to the next page, these are all the different services that we support. Like I said, electric, water, sewer, gas, Gas is a big one. One of the things that you all should know, because we are federally regulated because of gas, everyone in this company is required to take drug tests both when, before they start as well as randomly throughout their employment as part of our drug program. So we are an alcohol-free, tobacco-free, and uh, drug-free environment 100% of the time. And, that's, uh, and that is a huge savings for us. Uh, the other thing that we do in terms of supporting our customers is we build an IVR. It's actually an auto attend if you want to go to the next page. Um, and this structure is basically however we feel we need to build it out to support your city. Basically, when a customer calls in, they're going to call in from a main number that's going to get forwarded to IUC. When they hit IUC, we're going to be able to provide them with a greeting that's going to say, Thank you for calling the city of College Park. If you're calling about a power issue, press one, water or sewer issue, press two, 
streets or other service issue, press three. That brings them into our queue. At that point, they get the option of either talking to a live representative or if they want to use our automated system to report their issue, they can use our automated system. It's customer choice that allows them to go through or customer or we force it based off of high call volumes. Once we receive those requests, whether it's live over the phone or through our automated system, we process that the same as we would a live call. We confirm the information, we confirm the customer has the service with the city, we process the service request to create a work order, and then we dispatch the crews. Uh, in terms of mass event, what makes us a little bit unique is because we are voice over IP, we're able to process 100 simultaneous calls per client per line at any one time. So at any time we could have, for example, we had East Point with a power outage, we had Fairburn with a power outage, we had Washington with power outages all this weekend. Um, and we never missed a call. We still were able to handle 98% of all the calls that came through uh, on, on the system. The customers that hang up would hang up after they heard the message or hang up with, with um, uh, because their system, their issue was resolved. Um, going through to the next slide. This is a typical service application for us. Within HyperWeb, what we did was we put validation points in places where when we open a request, our system will validate that the customer is a customer for that service for that city. So when we load an address file for College Park, that customer address file is going to be listed in the system. So when we type in that address, the system tells us whether that customer has electric or doesn't have electric. So we won't miss, mix up customers that are customers from East Point calling into College Park to report an outage, just like we don't mess up customers from College Park when they call in to report an outage and they're actually uh, calling in for East Point to report an outage. Overall, to give you an idea of that effect, about 7% of all of our calls we resolve without having to dispatch a crew. And a big part of that is because customers, for whatever reason, are confused as to which city supports their electric, which city supports their water. So this helps us to validate that the customer has that service before we call a tech to dispatch a crew member. Go ahead. The other thing that we do to make this customized to you is I develop each of these blue pop-ups. We call this is our this is our online training and help file. Anytime you hover of, hover over a task in Hyperweb, such as a reconnect for non-pay or blinking lights, whatever your director or superintendent of that service wants us to respond, however they want us to respond for that type of an issue, it'll be embedded in this pop-up. So when my dispatchers log in and they create a service call if someone's calling in for electric and they're calling to get reconnected whatever your instructions are that you want us to follow they'll be embedded into each of these tasks where that's helpful is where you get into situations like blinking lights or you get into a situation like street lights or um, traffic lights in some cases some of our clients don't want us dispatching a crew if lights are blinking intermittently in a house during a storm they want the storm to pass they want to see if it's an issue with a limb on a line or some other service you get the ability to kind of develop that independently marietta power doesn't want us dispatching on a low line unless there's a power outage so we can customize each of these tasks to fit however you all want us to respond when your customer calls in to report that type of an issue. All right. We build help files to qualify the event. Anytime a call comes in from a power outage standpoint, the first call that we take on a power outage is gonna be, have you checked your breakers, reset your breakers. We're gonna ask qualifying questions to validate beyond the fact that they're a customer but we're gonna validate that they've checked their breakers. We're gonna validate they're not on a disconnect list. We're gonna validate that the lights outside their house are all shut off. Uh, in some cases, if you all have a lot of apartments, a lot of our apartments for East Point, for Marietta, some are master meters, some are individual meters. 
but in all cases, there's an outside disconnect. So as an example, with East Point and others, matter of fact, Calhoun, anybody that calls in to report a power outage, if they're in an apartment and they're the only ones that are reported out, then we have them check the inside breakers. We also have them out check the outside breakers to validate that those two aren't tripped before we send a crew out in the middle of the night. And again, this is to one, keep your costs down because we know we assess for each save or each non-report like this, we assess $125 to that, meaning we know that it costs you money to roll a truck. So if there are things that we can do on the front end to prevent you from wasting a crew trip at night to pay overtime and roll that truck, we wanna take those steps to make sure that we're, we're spending your money wisely. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we do that through verification. All right, go ahead. This is our dashboard. If you've noticed everything in here, you'll see yellow and black, you'll see black and white, and you'll see uh, red and white. Anything that's red and white, that's an emergency service request for us, meaning that from our dispatcher standpoint, they know that that request has to be called. So anything that's red and white, we always have to call a tech and dispatch to a tech. Kind of makes it easy for the, our dispatchers to recognize. Anything that is yellow and black, or in this case, black and white, these are tasks that the customer has said, just send me an email on that. I don't need to get a phone call. We'll check it out when we, during our business hours or when it's convenient for us. So the tasks that you select in our dropdown, we color code as an emergency call, red and white, a business hours work order in yellow and black, or also in black and white. So that's how we distinguish whether we wanna call the tech or say for a street light out, you don't need to get a phone call on that. You just need to get a service record. So on Monday you can drive by and repair the street lights on that particular intersection, All right? Um, reporting a service outage, uh, what is this for? Okay, that's the same thing. This is just the qualifier on the slide. Uh, these are the questions that we ask for that. It gets embedded in the system. You can move away from that page. Okay, I think we're going backwards. Here we go. All right, dispatch and close. So once we get on the dashboard, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna dispatch and close. When we dispatch and close, it sends this record information to your crew member. It also, we also assign it to that crew member. If you can go back one. Can you go back, yeah, back one slide. Nope. Uh, one more slide. Yeah, there you go, right there. So what, we're, what we instruct our dispatchers, because typically in our dispatch model, you've got a number one on call, you've got a number two backup, and then you've got a number three. We try to get three people to call in case the first call doesn't get answered by the number one. We have a number two, like a superintendent or a lead. And then we have a number three, which would be like a supervisor or director. When we, when we get in touch with whoever we talk to, we assign it to that person that we actually talk to. The reason being is you get a daily report. On your daily report, you're gonna see all the service records that we dispatched the night before, and you're gonna see which technician we assigned that record to. So if there's ever any confusion as to what the event was, what happened on the call, you'll know who actually we discussed it with and who went out to service that call. All right. It's also timestamped. It tells you the time it was the day and it tells you the time we dispatched. All right. When we pull it up, one of the things that's helpful to us, it helps us understand this is for Greer CPW in South Carolina, but when we put a record in, it gives us the geo mapping of that call. A lot of times crew members will call in, they might not be familiar with the street, they might not be familiar with the location. If they call us back, we can pull up the service record and we can provide them with cross streets of all the different locations that might for that particular address. Also, if they're in the habit of writing addresses down, Sometimes crew members will write the wrong address. Instead of 204, they might have written down 214. So when they call in, they say, hey, I can't find 214. Um, I don't see that there's an outage there or any issue. We'll be able to pull it up and say it was actually 204. 
So we work with the crews that way. We also get the phone numbers for the customers. So if we have to make a call, hey, the crew member's trying to find your house, can you go out on the porch, wave your hand? We can call the customer back and let them, let them know the status of that, of that particular dispatch, okay? This is an email sample of what gets generated anytime we dispatch a ticket to a crew member. It'll tell you the reason for the call. It'll tell you the tracking number. It'll tell you the operator who we dispatch to. It'll tell you the service type, the date, timestamp, the service address, um, the phone number, and if they had an email address, also the notes associated with what the service call was about. So that would go to the crew or anybody that's assigned to receive those notifications once they've been dispatched. This is a monthly report, quarterly report, and annual report. Um, what we do is we break out each utility service, the types of tasks that were dispatched out for the period of time, whether it's a month, a quarter, or a year, how many of those were caused, what percent within each department, and then also what percent of the total number of tickets dispatched did each department actually accumulate through the period of time. Certain clients like Winder, uh, Cairo, Greer, Marietta, and Calhoun use this report monthly to uh, allocate a percentage of the fees to those departments in reference to how they run their budgets. Okay. Um, basically, this kind of summarize, there are two different ways that people work with us. To start like Statesboro, for example, that just went live a few months ago, they basically want us to not qualify anything, not try to resolve any issue. They just want us to call their tech, let their tech get the information and let the tech decide whether or not it's something he wants to go out on or not go out on. There are other cities that we've been servicing for much longer that want us to qualify the event as to whether or not it's something that's on the customer side or on the city side, such as a sewer backup, such as a water leak. Um, those are the types of ways we can be as detailed as you want. We can qualify the event. If there's only one toilet that's backed up and you've got three toilets, that's a plug on your side. You need to get a plumber or we can notify the tech, whatever you all decide that you want us to do, we can build that into the system. Uh, but again, our goal here is to answer the call, not with just being people being able to answer the call, but with solutions that can save you money. Um, there are some clients of ours that we that we process calls for that when you look up the number of wrong addresses where the customers are calling in or you look at the number of issues we've resolved, our savings and not dispatching actually costs, it actually saves them more money than our service cost is for the month. So we can do a lot for you. Uh, we're excited about the chance to work with you guys. I've been talking to Hugh for five years about this. So to be in a position to talk to you all, I'm certainly thrilled about that and any questions that you have that you'd like to ask, I'm more than happy to try to address those. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the body? Uh, yes, Mayor, I have a couple. Uh, All right. First off, I, I think it was an excellent presentation. Uh, I also got some answers from you, Richardson, uh, before the meeting, so I feel pretty knowledgeable. The one area that, that isn't quite clear on uh, the intent of this, as far as I understand it, because it's also on the agenda for the regular council meeting, uh, is for power outages. So we're not talking about using this for all the other issues that we use uh, I notify for, for example. It, it, does that correct everybody, you? Yeah, that's, that's what we would start out with. We may eventually evolve into other, I mean, other departments can use this too. So yeah, we, we kind of just start out as power outages. Right, so if if someone calls in, and we'll publish this as a power reporting problem number. Now with the automated system that we have, it's my understanding that we get emails basically for every meter that goes offline, except for certain commercial meters. So if we have an outage in a city block, for example, 
we'd get a bunch of emails from all resulting from all the meters in that city block. And that lets you know pretty much the general area of the outage. Can we at that point then say, okay, for the people that live between Lyle and uh, Mercer and College and Victoria, those people in that block, uh, you have a power outage, we know about it, uh, you don't need to report it any further, we're working the issue. Can we construct that message quickly and get it into the answering mechanism so that when someone calls in, they immediately hear that message? And that means they don't have to log in and report a particular problem at that address. And that keeps the cost of the call processing down for us. Yes, I, I talked to Greg about that. What we can do, we can forward those uh, meter alerts to his team and they can look at it. Or, and we can also, in our power out response that we send out um, to everybody, we can include them in that. And I told uh, Glenn, we need to be more detailed about that so we can get the information to IUC. So yeah, that but I, I guess where I'm going you is when they call into the IUC center, do they first get a message? And, and maybe this is, is also a question for Greg, but do they get, first get a message saying, oh, welcome College Park power customer. Uh, Tonight, uh, what, what do you have to report? We'll connect you with somebody shortly. Or if there, we know there's an outage, good evening, College Park Power our customer. If you live in between uh, these streets that were in the recording, uh, rest assured, we are aware of the problem. Uh, we hope to have it maybe resolved by nine o'clock. Or if we don't know that, we're working the problem. Crews have been dispatched et cetera, et cetera. So again, you don't need to go further on the call. If so, who would, who would, who would, who would write that or create that uh, audio message? Uh, if I could interject, I think I have a place here to raise my hand. Um, well, there's actually, that's a great question. We actually had to do that for Lawrenceville this weekend. Uh, their substation four went out which affected about 5,000 of their 16,000 customers. And it went out around 1130. And what we did, because at first we didn't know that happened. So we got blown up with phone calls for 15 minutes. We dispatched the crew. We created two 300 work orders. Uh, at that time, Mike Tatum, the director of electric called me and said that the Georgia Power had a transmission issue. Georgia Power had been dispatched and power for those customers affected would be back on between four o'clock and five o'clock. So what I did then, and we have multiple people in the company who can do it, was I created a record in our system. So you, you're hundred percent correct. You have in our system an auto attendant. The auto attendant is the greeter. From that greeter, we have multiple options. With Lawrenceville, you've got gas calls, electric calls, and then customer service and streets calls. They no longer do water, they no longer do sewer. So depending upon how we built your system on our phone side, we would create a message just like we did for the Lawrenceville. We would call, we would say city of Lawrenceville or we'd say the city of College Park is currently experiencing a power outage in this section of town. Marietta Power gives us a list of all the streets. We list out all the streets associated with it. If we know a reason for an outage, such as a, a feeder locked out or a circuit locked out or a tree on a line or a down tree, we give them that information. And then we, if the customer or if the utility is comfortable with, with providing an estimated restoration time, we would provide that as well. Uh, we typically use six hours for a down pole, four hours for a, any other major utility issue. Uh, but we typically don't quote anything less than four hours. Um, but that would be at the direction of your utility, whatever you all would be comfortable with. In most cases, we don't offer an estimated time because we know how many things can go wrong in the process of restoring power. 
but we can so if way. oh i'm sorry go ahead no you're 100 right we can do it either way we can we can oh. add a message to it or if you all have the ability to add it before that call gets to us you all can do that okay so if if somehow you know to create the message you would create the message not one of us and that audio message if i happen to have my power out and i call in and i hear that audio message but i never get rooted so i hang up i'm, I'm a happy camper i know it's being taken care of then do we get charged for that call or not you get charged for that call if there's and no how much if, if if they just get the information we get charged for the call you get charged for a call anytime a call hits our line if it goes through yeah. and goes into our pool then it's going to record if that call is less than 20 seconds then you're not charged for that call any call over 20 seconds is charged even even if it hasn't yet been routed to a you attendant even if it's not if even if it's not been answered by an agent yes for yeah. example for example someone calls and we provided you information and there's a recording that says good evening thank you for calling the city of college park as of 6:26 p.m. we are aware of a power outage covering Lyle, Mercer, Walker, and Rugby between, between Main Street and Washington Road. Crews are out uh, working on this now, and we'll have updates for you as the evening progresses. Thank you for your, thank you for your patience. So that, that costs us. Yes, ma'am. And that costs us $1.50. Is that correct? No, it costs you whatever the dollar sign, dollars are assessed for those calls. So if you're a dollar twenty-five, it's either going to be a dollar twenty-five or a dollar fifty. One of those two. As long as if the call goes more than twenty seconds, it's going to be either a dollar twenty-five or a dollar fifty. Okay. See that's see that that's that's part of what I was missing because I I knew we got charged for a message that went to you if they texted in to you, or I presumably sent you an email. Uh, I knew we got charged for those at the lowest rate, whatever that was, 125, 150. But it wasn't clear to me whether we got charged for just hearing an announcement. Well, the problem. And, is, yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, that that that's that yeah. answer, that answers my question. Right. Uh, the problem is we don't know that that was the case. I mean, on our call report, it's going to run and show that there was a call that lasted 31 seconds. It's not going to show that it ran and was lasted 31 seconds, was answered by a rep, or if it was just 31 seconds. Because our call report shows anything over 20 seconds shows as a minute. It doesn't tell us whether it was actually answered by a machine or answered by a person. Okay. You, Richardson, and uh, Michael Hicks, if you're on, yes. uh, my, my next question is, if we have the power reporting number in College Park, just like we have now, and after hours, it gets routed to the police department. So my question now is, if after hours, it gets routed to the announcement line, which you, Richardson, or maybe the mayor, the mayor did such a great job on that <laughs> announcement. <laughs> maybe we should have the mayor do it. But uh, it gets rooted to an announcement created for that situation. And after the person hears the announcement, it says, now, if you have further questions or issues, uh, please hold on the line. And at that point, our automated system, which we have here, would then route it to IUC. So they, we could intercept it and save us a bunch of money by giving the announcement first at our end. But if we don't have an announcement yet, we're early in the game, then at that point it gets rooted to IUC until we can get our act together and get an announcement out there and intercept the call. Because when we have an outage here, if a tree goes down or a limb hits a line and, and doesn't uh, drop off, 
we could have 30, 40, 50 people call and it's not infrequent. Mm -hmm. So what I worry about is I looked at the estimate that you made, you Richardson made for the cost. And it worried me that if we have a series of outages and a whole bunch of people go offline, we could run our bill up real fast and, really? and cons consume that 400 minutes a month very quickly. And Let me ask a question add, real quick. Oh, I'm you, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, oh, Councilman Allen. You, uh, you talked about you created in Lawrenceville, you created the message to go out. How long, do you know how long it took you to create that message? Uh, it took me 20 I mean, the message itself was about 30 seconds long and it was created and loaded in less than five minutes from when I got the information. But you so had a had window that online in five minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, but you had a window there of what, 15 or 20 minutes when you didn't know what had happened and you got, you said you had two or 300 tickets that you generated? We had had about 50, usually it's about, Let's see, at that time of the night, you know, outage call for us is typically after the first call, it's about 30 seconds long. Uh, that's to take the customer's information, verify the information, and then report it through dispatching it out to the crews. Um, first call is usually around two minutes long, something like that, depending because we have to validate breakers and things along those lines. And if, you, and if there's other calls coming in, then we recognize other calls from that city. We abort them having to check breakers because it's just a waste of time. Um, so did you take two to 300 calls before you had that message issued? We took probably, we probably created about 70 work orders in the system from HyperWeb. And then there were probably about 30 people that reported through the automated system. So we probably had a total of about 100 calls in that 15 minutes that we processed. Okay. Then once Mike had indicated that it was the Georgia power issue, we put that message on. But one of the things you should know, customers are still going to push through. I mean, I think it's a great idea what you're talking about doing. Um, it's just preempting a call. And that's fine with us. It makes perfect sense. If you have the ability to do that uh, and to do it regularly, it would help. With East Point, East Point has a front end message on. They could change if they wanted to change that message to different ones. But in order to get us at East Point, you have to press five to go to IUC. So if you had, if you had the ability to create a message and load a message on your end, then it would certainly help reduce your cost. You would just need someone there. I mean, worst case scenario, if, if no one's there to be able to do it, we're going to load it on our side as soon as we know. Uh, the one thing I would tell you what um, the gentleman was speaking of is really helpful and what you all were speaking about was make sure that if you create a message that you're specific to the area in which you're creating that message for. Because you could have two different outages going on at the same time in two different sections of the city. Sure. I, I Well, I, I think that this... Some, some of the issues that we've had with uh, this issue has been getting information to our residents. It's not necessarily that College Park Power is unaware of these situations because of, because of the upgrades that we've made to the system. They, they, we know when, okay. when, the, when the power uh, is out somewhere. So, Mr. Richardson, can you expound a little bit on how you see this integrating with what you already do because I don't I mean do you need IUC to tell you where to go you already know that right uh we, we do in a way uh we still count on we have a, a helper that is on standby and when in the past the, the police department got a call that that police department called directly that helper it was 3 a.m or whatever and then he would respond of course we get the alerts Glenn and I get the alerts we know too we not, may not know at the exact minute that because we may, may be asleep or something. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, this uh, this would probably work well as far as what Councilman Clay was talking about, if our phone system can do that, and maybe maybe my head can address that part. I, I just don't want us to, to be duplicative if, so if we right. can avoid it, uh, because it's, 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 it's really, it seems like it's, 
really the issue of we know about it. We just need to let our residents right. know that we know and that we're working on it. Um, well, I mean, one. hold on one second, sir. Um, just because Mr. Richardson, can you give me an idea of how often you are informed of a power outage that you were unaware of? It would only be during the night. Uh, okay. if, if there's a power outage, uh, you occasionally sleep. Yeah. Okay. That's right. But, uh, but I eventually will find out, um, I would get a call or anything, something like that. But uh, immediately I, I get all the emails, hundreds or thousands of emails from the meters out. And then eventually I'll get a call or Glenn will let me know. Uh, here's what's going on. Gotcha. Now that, that, that's where I was coming from, Mayor. It, we have the advantage with, we've gone through several years of pain getting this automated meter system in, but now it's working so well that we have the advantage of knowing when power goes out. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes we know before the customer knows. So uh, there's no point in duplicating that capability and our phone system should be able to do what I suggested. And if it isn't, I would think we would add, be able to add that capability to it. Mr. Michael, Hicks. can you comment? I can. Uh, our phone system can definitely do that. We can add an opening message to our phone system that gives the general populace an update on where the outage is. And we can also add a tree for Ward 1, for Lyle, press 1, get an update for Ward 2, press 2. We can build that internally. Mike, how, how can you update that during the middle of the night? Um, you know, we just have to manage it. We have to dial in there. And, and when you guys say, hey, um, Lyle and Harvard is up, we put a message on there that says, hey, when they press one for Lyle and Harvey, now it says system has been restored. But my my concern is I want to be able to get this out to the citizens and not have the citizens call us. I want to be able to send a blast to all the citizens to give them a status rather than them having to dial a number for us. And we can do that oh. through code red, correct? Right. right. That's called code red. Right. Right. Provide it all of the numbers are dumped into that database. Code Red is only going to hit the amount of numbers that we have in there. Right. Well, if, you, if you're, only you're as not going to be in it, <laughs> that, that's yeah. why you so, put your name in. <laughs> but the, the other issue that I had was, okay, we're doing this for power. And we, who knows, later on, we might want to do it for other things. I think it's a wonderful service. But Initially, we're doing it for power. So what happens when someone says, hey, I don't want to use iNotify? It's much easier to just pick up the phone, call the power reporting number and say, there's a water main leak out in the middle of the street. Now, I don't want to waste if, if, if people calling this number that addresses only power how how do we how are we going to work that issue i think if it seems like and i know that we are considering this later on this evening but it seems like we may want to get our end of things shored up first in that you know if you do call that power outage number can we can we get that recording together? You know, thank you for calling the city of College Park. We're aware of a power outage on Main Street between Harvard and Rugby. And we're working on that right now. If you have another concern that doesn't relate to power, please press, please press five or something like that. I mean, if we can do that and we yeah. can get a sense of how well we respond to that. And we, it, I, I don't want us, I'm not saying this is not a good idea. I think this is a good idea, but I also want us to use the tools that we have to their, to their fullest extent before we move on and get more tools. Amen. I agree hundred percent with what all of you are saying. The one thing that I would tell you that's really helpful to our customers uh, when we do load a message, and that would be one of the things I would tell you to do on your side too. Uh, I guess it was Michael that was speaking about that, but one of the things you want to always make sure that you tell people is that if they were calling to report any other emergency, 
one of the things that helps us get services restored quicker to our customers is we identify where the problem started. So if there's a tree limb on a line, or if there's a down power line, or if someone's reporting a blown transformer, we get those reported separately. It's not just an outage. Your system's gonna record an outage, and it's gonna report an outage to you via email, but it's not gonna to report to you that there's a tree that's on a power line. It's not gonna to report to you that a transformer blew, or it's not gonna to report to you that there's a pole down at the intersection. That's where your customers are gonna to want to have to talk to someone. And if I can get a crew member to a location that's identified as the cause of the event, then your power is gonna be restored a whole lot longer, even though they're still gonna ride out the lines. But that's one of the other things that we do. And even in our messaging system, we tell people, this is where the issue is. These are the people that are affected. However, if you're calling to report a down tree, a down line, a blown, blown transformer, stay on the line and speak to a dispatcher so we can report that issue to the city. Um, that's, a, that's an excellent, excellent point. And I think uh, that's where we add into the message, but you, I think you just concluded with right. that uh, if, if just stay on the line or push five or push three as the mayor was suggesting and then you're rooted through and that what you say is if you can help us identify the source of the outage right. please stay on the line or push five right so said, there are people in the city of calhoun because calhoun is thirty thousand water customers only six thousand electric but there are people in calhoun when they have a water main break they will get in their cars and drive around and try to find the main break to call us to tell us where the break is so they get their water turned on faster. I mean, it's it's the strangest thing, but people actually, they do that. Well, I mean, I, I, and, and I think the water's a little bit different from electric in terms of the, the sophistication of those systems. Then my point is it's the same result. You've got a water outage, you've got a, a power outage. You got people that are gonna report the things. It helps us get services restored. Understood. Understood. Uh, Mr. Richardson, I mean, because usually when Mr. Spivey sends us emails about a particular outage, we we get the information about the source of this the problem. How long does it typically take you and your team to determine the source of the problem in a in a typical outage? Yeah, typically um, it's within an hour we know what the problem is uh, so we can we can update everybody by then all right here's what we found sometimes we can probably give you an estimate when it will be restored but we try to stay away from it till we till we start working on it uh, question yes mr hicks um madam mayor and council i think this this particular software can be expanded for much greater use, particularly on the customer service side. Uh, Greg and Hugh, I, I think we talked about this software could also be used to assist customer service with their overload of calls, correct? I, right now we're talking about after five o'clock, Mike. Um, and you're, you're oh. out during the day, right? Yeah, okay. Right, but I thought that was one of the uses uh, that this system was able to do was take additional uh, calls. From. Greg, you can you can address that. I, I, we did talk about that, but that's it'll be an extra expense. Oh, okay. Did I hear them say that they could, you know, they can take a call or you could report it online? Or am I just? I think you heard me say that, uh, Ken. Oh, okay. I, I read that in the information that I got somewhere. Well, I was just wondering if they report it online, how do you how do you calculate your minutes? Um, if a person, you all have a service there. What's it called? Q alert or something like that. I, I notify. I notify CP. I yeah. Notify. I think that generates an email. Yes, I believe it does. so. Yes, sir. Yeah. It it, it can. It's pro it's very similar. We accept Georgia 811 sends out email notifications for locates. Um, we process locates for four or five different cities, but it's the same process. Um, we would receive the notification. Fairburn has a notification process that they send through to us. 
we receive the notification, we create the record in HyperWeb, and then we dispatch the crew from the record that they email. Uh, the only thing that you're charged for on those notifications would be the data call, yeah. us being the email, which is $1.25, and then us calling your tech, so which is typically 30, 45 seconds of a phone call. So we receive the emails, we put them in the system, and we call the tech, so you build at whatever that amount of time would be, most likely less than two minutes total. And your reports indicate how many minutes are, are spent on each call or do they have a, are they bundled? Like you had 20 calls on such and such. Uh, it's per call per day, per time of day. So it would tell you how many calls came in. When we were doing the East Point uh, COVID-19 relief daytime business, we would break out the calls from eight to five that were, were taken and how many minutes those were. And then we separated that out on the report so they would know how many of our calls total for the month were related to COVID relief during daytime services versus how many were actually processed for after hours emergency services. And they kept those bills separate for you know, reimbursement issues with the state and things like that. So you would get a record of all calls received. You also get a record of those calls that were actually ended up in zero minutes because any call that hits is gonna generate a report. It's gonna trigger a number. It, that number is gonna be anywhere from a zero to, I don't bill anybody uh, double digits. So if we had a customer for whatever reason stayed on the line for 14 minutes because they just were upset about something and it took that long for us to appease them, no call gets billed over nine minutes. So anybody that called in, you wouldn't pay for however long we had to resolve it. You would only pay up till nine minutes. And you have a setup call charge of four thousand, or is it? It's six thousand, but we give uh, we give Electric Cities of Georgia a discount of two thousand dollars. So because you're part of ECG, you get a discount on that. How long do you anticipate if we were to go into a program like that? How long would the setup take? Uh, I can get any account set up and turned on in less than thirty days. The biggest thing is getting an address list. And I'm sure, I don't know what type of system you run and pull, but what we want to do is we want to be able to get a, an account number or a customer number, a street number, a street direction, a street type, a street name. And we want that broken down for the service. Then we load that into HyperWeb so that we have an active address list that when we type in an address, if it shows something other than then we get an alert telling us that this person calling in is not a customer for the city of College Park. And then we verify that and validate it before we tell them to call East Point or Georgia Power or Greystone or whoever else they might be supportive of. And you have a, a 90 day out clause? Yes. Yeah, all of our contracts go for 12 months. If you're never satisfied with the contract, then you can cancel in 90 days, give them 90 days to fix the problems. After 12 months, it goes month to month. Um, and I've had clients, my, my first two accounts were Washington and Douglas, and they're still my first, they're still my accounts. We haven't lost, knock on wood, we haven't lost an account since I set up the service. And we haven't increased rates on anybody since I've set up the service either. The rates that you're billed today are the same rates I quoted five years ago. All right, any additional questions? No. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all listening. And actually, I, I would love to have a chance to work with you guys. And I think you've got a pretty good platform. And anything we can do to help, I'm happy to do so. Thank you, sir. Sounds, sounds like a great system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Bye. All right. The second item on our agenda is a monthly progress report regarding strategic planning activities. And I believe, Mr. Hicks, you're going to be. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Mayor Council, we are just delighted to give you guys an update. Uh, we know that this is the end of the year, and we are, are delighted that we can give you updates on all five of the strategic goals. Uh, we've given you updates on governance and customer service by Michelle Johnson. 
quality of life was by our former director of Mike Mason. Public safety and security was uh, Chief Elmore. And tonight we're gonna have a combined presentation of uh, local economy growth and transportation and mobility. Jackson Myers, Michelle Alexander, and Nikki Washington has been working as a team uh, to get this presentation going. And so we're delighted that we have given an update on all five of the goals. So I think Nikki's gonna do the presentation tonight. Sure, yeah, I can okay. kick us off. All right, so as we, um, I'm sure we've heard before, the objectives of the local economy and growth group, as well as transportation, we've been working together um, since so many of these go hand in hand um, to develop a, a citywide growth-oriented comprehensive plan. Hopefully everybody has heard about the comprehensive plan at this point, we've been really drilling it in. We've had a lot of really great community feedback. Um, we've had three community meetings and um, one specifically on housing, one specifically on transportation. We've also met with the old National Highway Merchants, um, Woodward Academy, uh, the Housing Authority, and our Main Street group. So we're feeling really good that we have a lot of really great input and we're gonna be bringing that um, for a workshop item at the July 19th meeting. So you guys can have a chance to review it before the public hearings. Um, the, other goals here, ensure the comprehensive plan addresses transportation throughout the city as well. So we're gonna have that as one of our goals in the comprehensive plan update. Um, develop innovative ways for hotel, GICC, and future Six West guests to access downtown. As we know, this is Jackson's, one of Jackson's big, big projects is the pedestrian bridge. Um, we have secured the uh, bid for that and cost estimates. Um, I'm not sure, is Jackson on the call? I don't see him. If he has anything he wants to add. Do you have anything yes. you want to add about the pedestrian bridge, Jackson? It's just that it's it uh, has a cost overrun because of the uh, steel. So we've, uh, uh, ARC is talking about giving us uh, extra money. And then also uh, Congressman Scott's office is, is also got it when they build passes for some infrastructure that will they also given us uh, funding for that. So we're looking for additional funding and we're hoping the cost of steel goes down uh, later on this summer. Right. Yeah, we're excited to see. I know we're all excited to see that project happen. Um, the other, one of our other big goals, um, objectives of this committee was to automate the permit filing procedures and streamline decision-making progress. Um, the first step that we established for that was to get some SOPs written, actually written down and into some manuals. So the SOPs for the building department have been completed. So that's a big step for us. And um, another milestone um, related to transportation is the designing of Road Street for uh, Six West for the network spine that's gonna be the main uh, thoroughfare of Six West. We're moving along on that as well. Um, some anticipated completion, just some upcoming things coming out of the committee. Um, we will have the draft comprehensive plan in July. So we're going to bring that, as I said, to that workshop item meeting and, and get it moving, hopefully to, transmitted to um, DCA to uh, them in August. And we're going to finalize the flowchart review process. Um, we're planning to have our planning SOPs done. Um, at the beginning of July, we're almost almost completed with those and also released the RFP for the permitting software, um, hopefully before September 2021. We have had a few presentations of some different options for that. So I know um, Mr. Hicks has been um, also a big part of that. So I want to make sure we, we get, uh, get the best one for, for what we're looking to do. And I think that's it, unless anybody else has anything to add or you guys have any questions um, about what the committees have been working on. Uh, Ms. Washington, I have a question yep. in regard sure. to the uh, SOPs. Yes. For the building department. When do we, I, I so we've completed those. Great. Um, yes. When are we implementing? How do we, how do we see that timeline rolling out? So we're really hoping, so ours should be, the planning departments um, will be done 
first week in July. Um, and then I think our, our next step will be to really talk out, okay, how do we work these together? That's part of that finalizing the flowchart review processes. And then, um, the, and then doing it, right? <laughs> and then implementing. So making sure um, that we're following those processes. Um, luckily, we have a standing meeting set up for this committee every other week. So we should be able to hold each other accountable and make sure that those SOPs are happening as we say they are. Um, we also are hoping that the permitting software will be a really big step in making sure those processes link together and so that we can see those permits move through the system, we can see those reviews happening um, and, and keep better track um, of how that process works all in one place. All right. Any other questions for Ms. Washington? I just want to say, I think it was an excellent report, very encouraging. And uh, I don't I don't have any questions at, at this point. I had some of those questions of where were we on? And then this answers them. So thank you. Of course. Okay. All right. So uh, Madam Mayor, again, in conclusion, we're just delighted to let you guys know that we've given you updates on all five of the strategic goals. So. Mr. Myers, you don't really have your hand up. Okay, all right. <laughs> it was just. <laughs> Things happen. Things get clicked on. Okay, all right. Mr. Hicks, I'm sorry. Did you have anything else to add? Uh, no, ma'am, just, just telling you that we've given you all updates on all five of the strategic goals and we're happy that we've achieved that through the year. Absolutely, and as we kick off our new fiscal year starting July 1st, I look forward, and I think the, the rest of the council looks forward to all the things that, that you're gonna to continue to achieve as, as we work together. Appreciative of your leadership in, in making that happen. Thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, it looks like we've got about 33 minutes before we all reconvene for the regular meeting. See everyone in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.